Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing today? Yeah, hey, you got energy. Can everybody do a, can, can y'all do a little exercise with me? Everybody take a pause. Everybody take a deep breath and smell the roses. Hold it. I smell the coffee too. And then exhale, blow out the candles. I used to do that with the preschoolers when they were feeling anxious or they just needed a moment to reset. And to set the mood too, right? Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so happy to have you here if you're a first time visitor. Uh, welcome to New Life. My name is Mansoor Yagoob, also known as Doobie, no relation. Uh, and I am the engagement director here at New Life. Um, if you are a first time visitor, this is your first time, you know, joining us in person or online. Uh, one of the ways you can connect with us uh, is that word right up there on the uh, screen. Uh, just go ahead and type connect to that number. Um, if you're a first time visitor, um, we'd love to see you. We'd love to meet you and get to know who you are. Um, and if you're a regular attendee, if you're a family, right, uh, just go ahead and text here if you want to let us know that you're here, if you want to send in any prayer requests. Um, currently, New Life is going through the series Rooted. Uh, have you ever wondered uh, what it is all that, what is, what is that thing that all Christians believe, right? What is it that we all hold in common? We have so many differences, uh, but there are a few things that we hold in common. And so that's what we're going through. We're going through those things that all Christians from all walks of life hold in common. Uh, this Sunday is special though. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. Everybody say, woo! Yeah, you can talk back to me. It's okay. Yeah, Palm Sunday, where we celebrate the arrival of King Jesus riding in to Jerusalem as the crowds cheered and they laid down the palm leaves honoring him. And so that's what we want to do today. We want to celebrate King Jesus. Easter is coming next Sunday. In case you didn't know, uh, we would love to see you here. Please come and join us. Um, I got some fancy t-shirts for my welcome team that's coming. So I want to show it all. Got some fancy name tags too, y'all. So we would love for you to join us. So um, we're going to go ahead and just jump right into worship. I'm sure you probably noticed if this uh, if you're used to being here. Uh, I'm not Victor. Uh, Neil, who is our worship arts director. Um, Victor is currently out sick, um, so if you can keep him in prayers, just go ahead and keep him in prayers. Um, he's doing perfectly fine. I sent him a hilarious meme earlier this morning to pick him, pick me up. Um, but we just want to go ahead and thank Christy. Uh, she decided to step in for us today uh, graciously, and so can y'all give her a round of applause? Don't worry, she is going to kill it today, but we wanted to cheer her on beforehand anyways for just being gracious enough to step up, so thank you. Um, so let's just go ahead uh, and join in worship. If you could please stand, let's go ahead and get to it.
and it's true. Our praise does open prison doors. Oh, I like that. Was that a little hymn you threw in there in the middle? Right there? I'm like, yeah, I've been telling myself, we need to do a little bit of hymns. I love me some hymns. Yes. I just am going to pray for us before we go into the reading, uh, before we go into our middle section, but I just want us to just rest in that. Praise opens prison doors. When you are confused, when you feel trapped, when you don't know how to move forward or you don't know where to turn to, when you, you feel that your mind is just playing tricks on you, saying you, you can't do it. Why would you even try? You just remember, praise opens prison doors. All I got to do is praise. Give God all the honor, all the glory, and just worship. And see if it doesn't necessarily change your situation, but it doesn't change you and how you respond to your situation. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And our worship connects us to him. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Heavenly Father, first off, we want to say thank you. Thank you for not just the things that you've done, but for who you are, for the ways that you love us, for the ways that you keep us, for the access that you give us to you. So that way, when we do call on your name, things happen. Circumstances begin to shift and our demeanor and our outlook on life is changed. You give us new eyes to see, new ears to hear, and so we just thank you. And Lord, as we move into the rest of this worship service and as we move into the rest of this Palm Sunday celebrating and just welcoming Jesus in for the greatest moment in the biggest showdown in history and the greatest win to have ever taken place, that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we will celebrate next Sunday. We just want to thank you for the opportunity to give you all the praise and all the glory. So be with us, be with our pastor, be with this worship team, be with our tech team, be with the people, be with all of us, as we know you already are. And so we just want to honor you by praying that family prayer that, we, that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, be seated. I know I pray a little bit different than Victor pray. I, I get heavy. Uh, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love her so much. You never know what she's going to say. <laughs> but speaking of prayer, we have a few prayer requests that we want to, because we are a praying church. Uh, Diane Dibble is recovering from a gallbladder removal, so keep her in your prayers. And Ron McNeil is recovering from cataract surgery. Although an interesting thing about Ron, this week we had a bit of an issue uh, with a false alarm happening here at the church. And so even though he is recovering from cataracts, he came up here last night to check on that false alarm and make sure everything was all right. And not only that, he is out there today serving. So can y'all just give him a round of applause? That's the kind of community that we have here, a community that says, hey, it's not about me. Even what I'm going through, I'm willing to come and serve this community because this is a community of believers. A couple of birthdays that we have, Brandon Jeter. Woo! Yeah. And then birthdays under 18, we have Jackson, Anthony, and Lily. So happy birthday to all of you wonderful, wonderful individuals. A couple of generosity highlights because we are a generous church. Um... We are thankful for all the ways that you give, not just financially, but also in your time, in your presence, and you're serving our community. And so we wanted to take a moment to um, just mark out our church work day. Um, our church work day, we had a bunch of people come through. Um, I don't know if there's pictures. There's pictures. Y'all see that mulch out there? 
See how fresh it looked, those flowers? I came in this morning, I've been out, and I said, yes. That's the dedication of people who love this community because this is this building and this 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 space it, it serves our community and so they came and they just poured their love into it also get ready to check out that uh cross out there in the front it's gonna be real pretty for easter yeah um not only that we want to celebrate rodney or cut replacing the front spigot i don't know you know what a spigot is i don't know i didn't have one growing up but <laughs> Depending on how old you are, you know what a spigot it is. It's that thing you go out there, you pump the water. Well, it had broke um, around the winter time, and Rodney came in and he replaced that spigot. So thanks, Rodney. Uh, you are amazing. Um, we also want to celebrate um, Caritas. Uh, one of the uh, ways that you can serve in our community volunteer uh, is cooking for Caritas, where um, every other month we prepare a meal for 100 women at a shelter for the Caritas um, organization, nonprofit that's uh, in downtown Richmond. And so we prepared some meals. <coughs> Sorry about the cough, the sound worse than it is. Uh, and uh, we prepared that meal. But not only that, our youth cooked. Yes, that's right. Y'all didn't know your kids could cook. But I tell you, they can, if you give them a recipe, they can do just about anything. So we got a couple of pictures up there with some of our youth and then our uh, next generation's director, uh, Jenna Bush, leading the charge. I came in and said, let me not be over their shoulder as a secondary cook because uh, uh, they don't need that. So I got out the way. Um, but just thankful for the youth in that. And then I also wanted to celebrate and point out that we have our special offering coming up, our Easter offering. Um, we, our Easter special offering is for all God's children's camp. Um, I don't know, I'm sure many of you know what it is, but All God's Children's Camp is an organization that um, allows children the ages 7 through 12 um, that have an incarcerated parent to have the camp experience. Um, and all they ask for is $10 from the kids' parents just as a way of showing a level of commitment to it. And they get to do things that they probably would never be able to do, um, you know, despite their certain with in spite of their circumstances and situations. So they get to go ski, not, not skiing, I'm tripping. They get to ride in canoes and they get to swim and they get to uh, do archery and hold the bow and arrow away from the crowd. Um, and we get to be a part of that. We get to collect and we get to um, put our funds towards making sure that they get the kids um, this summer to be able to give them that experience. So um, you can go online to the website, click the special link um, and donate to that. Yeah. All good. So that being said, we're going to have the reading of scripture for our wonderful Mary. If you could stand for the reading of God's word. I'm a little old school. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 27, verses 11 through 31. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges that are bringing against you? Pilate demanded. But Jesus had no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. 
And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Mary, you can leave that. I'll take that. Thank you. Welcome to Palm Passion Sunday. Long ago, the church uh, recognized that um, there's such an enormous um, amount that happens on Palm Sunday through the Holy Week, and that sometimes folks are um, not uh, attending both a Palm Sunday service and a Good Friday service. And so they, they said, you know, let's bring both emphases of the week into one, one service. So this becomes Palm Passion Sunday. What a contrast there is between Palm and Passion Sunday. Palm being when Jesus rode in and them laying down their, the uh, palm branches before him. And then Passion, meaning the, the part where he suffers for us. Um, and just to kind of pull us into this, um, the pull of a crowd is powerful. If you know it's true, say, uh-huh. Just consider the lemmings. Lemmings, you may know, cute, fuzzy, furry little creatures. Uh, but you've heard that if one goes off a cliff, the whole gang decides to go off a cliff. That's where when our teenagers go out, they, we say, if your friends would jump off a bridge, would you do so too? Because it's the lesson of the lemmings, okay? Um, We know that us, when we were teenagers and other teenagers around us, do strange things when in a crowd that they wouldn't do if they were alone. Um, Also, we know that at sporting events, can I just get an uh uh-huh? People do crazy things. Uh, You know, there is the power of the crowd is, is a massive pull. And the same is true about this week, starting with Palm Sunday going through the the suffering and the passion of Christ and ending with Easter at the end. And uh, we'll miss something if we just jump from Palm Sunday, yay, hooray, celebration, to Easter, yay, hooray, celebration, and miss the cross that's in the middle. So just to kind of compare and contrast Palm Sunday a little bit, Palm Sunday, there was quite a stir in Jerusalem. Um this particular Passover, Jesus came riding in on a donkey. He was fulfilling a scripture passage in in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, that um, says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And so this is just one of the hundreds of fulfillments that Christ uh, fulfilled. But he's coming in and people are rolling out the red carpet. They're laying down their cloaks, their palm branches on the ground, and they're shouting. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, we see that Jesus was at the center of the procession and the, the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. Another translation is Hosanna, which literally means he saves or save us. And so um, you can imagine all this was going on. And finally, Jesus's glory is being recognized on earth. The warrior king had arrived or so the people thought. The warrior king who was going to set things right, going to get rid of the Roman oppressors and put the Jewish people back into their proper place. But Jesus had a different way of leading. The religious leaders, they were were concerned, but they were unified. 
They had a common enemy. For centuries, they had been divided pretty drastically, uh, the religious leaders, into a couple camps, uh, especially at least two camps. Perhaps you've heard of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Pharisees, great keepers of the law, and the Sadducees were Sadducee because they didn't rep- believe in the resurrection. Okay, I thought that was a little funny. But anyway, the, so somehow they had a common enemy in Jesus. And suddenly all the religious leaders were united front against him. And they weren't going to let this popularity go unchecked. They plotted to kill Jesus. Um, they arrested him, held an illegal court overnight. They convicted him on false charges, brought up false witnesses. And then they took it to the empire to see if the empire could do for them what they could not do. See, they did not have the ability to um, kill a man. But the Roman Empire did. Come on, Good Friday. Some of the crowd was the same as just days earlier. The same ones shouting, Hosanna, save us, and laying down their cloaks, and laying down palm branches, rolling out the red carpet, now had changed. And they're the ones shouting, crucify him, crucify him. In fact, um, the chief priests and elders had, had tried to um, stir them up in Matthew 27, verse 22. Pilate, after kind of reviewing Jesus and, and hearing the concerns, Pilate couldn't really find anything wrong. He said, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And they shouted back, what? Crucify him. Crucify him. They arrested him for blasphemy, which is claiming to be God. When you're not God, that's a problem. But when you are God, it's not really blasphemy, is it? But this was not a problem for the Romans. So the religious leaders had to come up with some other things, other charges. Things like, um, he says that you shouldn't pay taxes. Or that um, he claimed to be king. Or that he was causing riots. All of this, the Roman government would have problem with. And might, might uh, come to their side. I love how Andy Stanley in his book, um, Not In It to Win It, great book. Um, he, he kind of pulls this out and he says, Yet this is the one who, when nationalism was at its all-time high, at the Last Supper, John 13, verse 34, this is what Jesus says. Now I'm giving you a what? New commandment. As if they needed a new commandment, another one, really? Like they've got hundreds, Uh, but a new commandment, love each, what? Other. That doesn't sound new, but as Andy Stanley says, it wasn't new, but Jesus wasn't through. I love that. Love each other just as I have loved you. Read the last part with me. You should love each other. Wow. That's, that's Jesus. Um, This whole idea that love is to be the number one primary characteristic of the people that are following Jesus. And just in case you're wondering what that love looks like, there's a sermon series coming near to a church near you after Easter uh, called Holy Love. We'll talk about that. But when all power, all authority had been given to Jesus, he demonstrated what you do when you have all the power, all the position, and all of the privilege. What do you do when you have all the power, the privilege, and the position? Jesus said, you call me Lord, you call me master, and rightly so. And that's when he picks up a towel, takes off his outer garment, and then stoops to wash the feet of the disciples. And he says, now you all do what you have seen me do. What do you do when you have all the power, all the position, and all the privilege Jesus refused to leverage it for himself. Rather, he leveraged it for the people all around him. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Seriously, Jesus? All the religious leaders have all the cards. They're stirring up the people. The empire is about to crucify you. And your marching order is love Don't you think that's a little weak? 
Don't you think that's a little way out? That's the best you got. Love one another as I've loved you. Why not play the God card? I've got all the power. I've got all the position. It's time y'all recognize who I really am. Ba-boo! Right? But he doesn't. He doesn't. So Pilate asked this pivotal question, what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And that's the pivotal question for you and the pivotal question for me. Maybe we'll learn from the crowds and guard against superficial commitment to Christ. But through the good, the bad, the ugly, Jesus remains Lord of all, whether or not we acknowledge it. So we've been talking about the Apostles' Creed and um, taking, these are the, the basic elements of faith that uh, regardless of all our disagreements, we can agree on these things. And so that first section talks about the Father, but then it goes into, I believe in Jesus Christ. And, and here's, there's a whole lot in this creed about what we claim to believe about Jesus. So read the part with me that says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended to the dead. Let's stop there. Because that's kind of where we are. That's where we're sitting today. This idea of suffering under Pontius Pilate, and he was crucified. Pilate was recognized all the plot of the people and the religious leaders. He knew what was going on. He could see through their shenanigans. And he tried to do the right thing, tried to release Barabbas, tried to wash his hands of guilt. But even though his wife warned him, he fell subject to his own fear, fell subject to the, the pressure to perform, to keep peace in the territory, because he knew if he didn't keep peace in this area, that would be it for him. And he didn't need a rebellion over some seemingly insignificant man. So he thought handing him over to be crucified was appropriate use of force. And he handed down an unjust sentence and handed a man over to be crucified, an innocent man. And thus Pilate becomes a villain, villain or the designated bad guy in our story today. But it's amazing to me in the Apostles' Creed that, that the writers thought to include Pontius Pilate. Of all the names that they could have named in this, they did this intentionally. They did it intentionally to put a time stamp, to put a, a recognition that this was a, an event in history. Pontius Pilate, you can look back through history books, and he ruled between 26 AD and 36 AD. So there was a Pontius Pilate. And there is record of this man coming before him, Jesus of Nazareth. And so they wanted to make sure that it was in here, recognizing this is an event. It's not some fairy tale that happened a long, long time ago in a place far, far away. This is real. It happened in a def de defined place at a defined time. God himself entered into history in order to meet us and redeem us, came down to meet us where we are in time and space, came down to our level to bring us up to his, came down in order to bring us home. This is God. This is God acting in history, this is God continuing to act in history. And so then, Jesus' trial, his suffering, the crucifixion, it was all public. It was in the view of so many people so that they could see what was happening and impossible for anybody to deny what they saw. That this God-man would suffer under the edict of Pilate. And this represents the rejection of Jesus by the world, the disowning and the rejection of the creator by the creation, rejected by people who knew him from his youth, condemned by the leaders of the Jewish people, condemned as a political threat to the 
Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome in the area, all because Jesus was trying to lead, yes, a love revolution. So the behavior of this crowd that could be praising at one end of the week and then shouting, crucify him at the other end of the week is, is just a demonstration. It points to our sinfulness of the human behavior. All people, no matter who we are, no matter where we live, we are all sinners needing God's forgiveness and reconciliation. And sin has this ability to destroy our ability to recognize God coming around us. And he comes among us. Yet God is able to transform us, to forgive guilt of sin, break the power of sin, and cleanse of the stain of sin. But under Pilate's watch, Jesus suffered. He was flogged. He was mocked. He was crucified. And the creed reminds us of the cost of Jesus' breakthrough into humanity. That Jesus suffered, really suffered, so that we might be forgiven, really forgiven. Well, it says that Jesus was crucified. Matthew uh, chapter 27, verse 31, seems like an understatement, but it says, When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be what? Crucified. Perhaps the darkest moment the disciples ever faced. Oh, they were familiar with the Roman form of execution. Hundreds of people had been executed. It was their favorite form of execution. They, were, they had perfected the form of torture. And um, so they were familiar, whether you were a Greek or a Roman, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, everyone knew this form of execution. And it was to serve as a deterrent. It was, it was intended to absolutely humiliate. Not only was it painful, but a part of the crucifixion Some of it's described, you see it pictured as Jesus high on a cross. But most likely, Jesus was on a cross, but right on the level ground with everyone else. If anything, raised just a little bit. So that there you are staring the naked son of God in the face. As they spat upon him and they mocked him. He wasn't distant. He wasn't far away. He was close. After having been flogged, after carrying the cross beam to the place of execution, eventually once you were, you were nailed, you would die from exhaustion, just unable to breathe. It was shameful. It was degrading. And it was reserved for the lowest of all criminals. You can imagine that as Christianity tried to spread, pagans or those who were non-believers had a real tough time with this. If crucifixion is reserved for the lowest of all criminals, you want me to worship someone who hung on a tree, who even according to Jewish literature is cursed, and you want us to worship him and say that he is worthy of all glory and honor and praise? You can understand why they might have a difficult time to worship and obey an evil man and his cross. But he suffered under Pontius Pilate and it was our sin that brought about his suffering. Many of you all know about the cross and the crucifix. And um, there's just a few differences I'd like to kind of point out. Protestants, we are very familiar with the cross. The cross is as empty of, uh, of Jesus, but it's, it's plain, it's simple, and yet it's perhaps one of the most recognized symbols in the world. All over the world, throughout history, 
most people will, if you show them a picture of this cross, will be able to draw an association that a man died on it at one point. Also, the most replicated piece of art in history is the crucifix. The crucifix includes the body of Jesus. And there are many, many, many different forms, many, many different depictions, painted, carved, sculpted, formed. There are billions of representations of the crucifix, which is Jesus on the cross. Protestants are often known for favoring the cross, the cross, which does not have Jesus because Jesus is no longer on the cross and he has risen. And we celebrate that. And every time we see an empty cross, we recognize what Jesus went through for us. And yet he is there no longer. He has risen and sits at the right hand of God. And from there, he's going to come and judge the living and the dead. And yet the Catholic faith holds on to the crucifix and for good reason to recognize all that God went through it emphasizing the suffering was not of his own, but ours. And we are rescued from it. And that's the great trade-off that happened. Christ chose to suffer in our place that we might have life. It's a pretty good trade-off. Love how, um, and I, I think it's important for us to recognize both the cross and the crucifix. And I hope that we'll spend some time this week thinking about that and the difference and even spend a little more time considering the crucifix throughout the week. Um, I've been reading uh, this book, The Wood Between the Worlds. And uh, in it, the author, Brian Zond, he, he makes this um, statement that the meaning of the cross is not singular, but kaleidoscopic. I love it. Kaleidoscopic, a, a, a big fancy term to just kind of say, when you look at the cross, it's almost as if you're looking through a kaleidoscope. You remember that thing as a kid, you put up to your eye and you look and you just see all the bright colors. And if you twist it just even a little bit, the light comes in and I can't remember, I think refracts in, in so many different ways, right? You turn it just a little bit more and it shows it again. This is Brian's point that as we look at Christ on the cross, there are so many different things that teaches us about Jesus. One, yes, that he paid the price for our sins, but just like kaleidoscope is the Greek word for beautiful form, the cross is an infinite number of ways of viewing the beautiful form that saved the world. And so, yes, it's, it's true that Jesus died on the cross for us, but not as a punishment, not to satisfy an angry God. If we go back to uh, Exodus and we, we read about the Passover, we read that that lamb was taken and it was sacrificed in order to be, provide a meal for the family and then the blood over the doorway to protect them from death so that they might have life. In the same way, Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, takes them away once for all, for all people, if we'll accept it. But Jesus wasn't punished for our sins, but he, he was provided in such a way that it might protect us and give us life. And so when we look at the cross, it reveals so much about the nature of who God, God demonstrating self-sacrificing love, the greatest picture of love known to humankind. Sometimes we wonder, does God really love me? The cross is proof enough. It's proof enough. God would do anything to get our attention go through anything and everything in order to help us know just how deeply God loves us. So what should we do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? What should we do? It's 
a question for each of us and we each have to answer it on our own. And I love how Andy Stanley puts it in, not in it to win it. He says, turns out Jesus was playing a completely different game with a different set of rules and consequently a different definition of winning. Jesus played to lose so the other team could win. Jesus played to lose so sinners like you could win. So sinners like me had a chance and a second chance and a third. Then he extended an invitation to those of us who won because he lost. Follow me. Follow me. Friends, on Good Friday, we'll talk about the fact that Jesus died and he was buried. There's great significance in that has great implications for us. But in case you're not a part of a Good Friday service, I pray that you'll find some time during the day just to pause, maybe even midday, just to pause and recognize before I run from saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, he saved us to Easter. He is risen. He is risen. Pause and recognition of the significance of the cross. Would you pray with me? God, we know that sometimes we, we take this for granted. Sometimes we um, are uh, too quick just to um, feel like we know this story. Feel like we um, are too casual with it, God. So this Easter, we pray that we would Go slowly to the empty tomb so that we don't miss that you had to go through the cross first. And just like we heard several weeks ago, how you descended to the depths, may we be reminded that what that means is that in our worst of times, in the hardest seasons of life, when tragedy strikes, you understand and you get it. You weren't saved from suffering. And that in our suffering and in our difficulty, we have a God who understands and doesn't leave us, doesn't abandon us. So God, thank you. Thank you for this cross that demonstrated your power, that demonstrated your greatness, that demonstrated your goodness and your self-sacrificing love. What a picture. God, help us to um, let it sink deep in. And this Easter, whether we've said it before or saying it for the first time, say, I choose to receive your sacrifice for me on my behalf that I might have life. And then because of it, have power to overcome sin and to live for you. So God, thank you for this time when you demonstrated your goodness and your greatness. We pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our closing song?
So he let those soldiers take him in As his friend betrayed him with a kiss There before the mocking crowd Like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a so good about Good Friday because Sunday is coming I never understood that when I was a kid I was like why do they call it Good Friday didn't he die but it was that moment when he died that was the moment that it was it was, it was finished the wages Paid. The offering made. It's done. It's done. But that's not where it ended. That's where the victory was won, but that's not where the story ended because then came new 
life, resurrection, a grave turned into a garden, death made life. Everything was turned on its head. He's been preaching and teaching his whole life, or at least for three, three years, he's been preaching about this kingdom that flows in reverse where the the least of these are the greatest among us where our leaders are servants where the leaders aren't served but wash the feet of those that serve and then he does the ultimate thing he challenges our expectations and he rides in on Palm Sunday on a virgin donkey and they shout Hosanna Hosanna and they're laying down the palm leaves they're like he's the king he's about to come yay here he comes and then he allows himself to be taken to be punished for a crime he didn't commit and to be killed and, and to suffer a death that he didn't deserve and you're like whoa what happened what's up with this what's what's it, I thought, Hosanna in the highest. And then he dies. And you think, oh man, it's over. But if you have been paying attention, he said the kingdom flows in reverse. And what was dead shall come to life. Take off the grave clothes and walk into a new day. I love that song. We got to sing that one for Easter. I got a couple things for you. That's just my little tidbit. Didn't need to add it. Um, (laughs) I'm telling you, that call sounds worse than it is. Uh, Info session about general and annual conference. Uh, Make sure you save the dates. Uh, More info is to come. Uh, For those of y'all that don't know, we are a Methodist church. This matters. Keep up. Make sure you're paying attention to it. Uh, We have the Big Serve coming. Woo! Yeah! More information to come about that. (laughs) This will be an opportunity for us to go out into our community and be the hands and feet of Jesus and to love our community and just go forth and serve, right? Serve here at our church and then go serve out in various locations. Um, The form is up for that. Um, It's going to be happening April 21st uh, at 10 a.m. That's a Sunday. So just like how we do our those of you who know do our serve projects um it's going to be just like that but it's gonna be a little bit different and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get closer uh easter invites be sure to pick up an easter invite card they are out there in the lobby in the prayer hands they are also going to be in the hands of our welcome team as they say goodbye to you so if you don't have one pick it up because we got some good things coming up this week um before easter uh, if you have any, if you want any more information about other things that you can do, other next steps to follow, you can go to our Connect Desk. Um, Maria, that is the lovely Pastor Mike's wife, First Lady Maria. <laughs> That's so old school. But yeah, no, it, she's out there. She's at the Connect Desk. Go say hi. Go ask questions. If you're a new to a first-time visitor, go talk to her. Um, she can get you connected to us. Um, you can also look outside. If you look over the Connect Desk, there's a giant TV. I didn't know it was there for three months, but it's there. Just look up, and you'll see all the information that's up here. It'll be scrolling out there. Um, you can also check out the info cards that are in the pockets behind the seat. Um, you can check us out on social media, uh, New Life UMC on Facebook, or you can go to our church website. You can find all this information there. So, all good? I say, yeah. Come on, dude, we gotta go to lunch. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all as you go forth into the rest of this week. Amen, amen, and amen. Go forth in peace.